We should be inspiring people to go pick nettles and make tea. We should be inspiring people to make a spit poultice with plantain and show them that you may not even know what your heritage is or you may not know what your background is or you may not even know anything. But if this feels right, if this makes your bones sing, then come have a cup of tea and let's talk about it, you know? Hey friends, welcome to Medicine Stories. I'm Amber Magnolia Hill. Today I'm sharing my interview with Farai Harold. This is just some deep folk herbal talk, which is what I'll be focusing on for the next couple episodes as well. Really just feeling that after talking to Marisha, feeling that return to the earth and wanting to have almost like a mini series of the podcast where we just have really, yeah, simple conversations on everyday home folk herbalism. So let me tell you real quick about the Patreon giveaways. The first one is from my guest, from Farai, and it's a really beautiful, I'm loving the looks of this, PDF, ebook, 17 pages, 10 herbs for the family medicinal herb garden. And what is covered is why grow herbs, the 10 herbs, how to source the herbs, and ways to grow the herbs. Yeah, really beautiful. The second one, so that one is for patrons at the $2 level. This is all at the Medicine Stories Patreon page. The second one is a little resource guide that I have put together on what to do when someone gets a tick bite. As you'll hear towards the end of this episode, we get into kind of first aid and like the herbal remedies that we always want to have on hand for ourselves, our kids, our animals. And we we go into ticks, into tick bites, and I started putting the resources in the show notes as usual, but then I thought, I'm just going to put them all together in one place and put it on Patreon, but I just can't bring myself to put it behind a paywall, even if it is only $2, so it's going to be there, open to the public, and please check it out now if this is something that you that you fear, that you know you have ticks in your area, and you don't already know what to do when someone has a tick bite, you want to read this before that happens, not when you're in a panic and it's too late because that little shit is already embedded deep in someone's flesh. So it's there. There's also one link to a resource I really like about Lyme, but in general, I'm not trying to give any advice or opinions on Lyme disease because I don't know very much about it at all. But I do think that resource is a pretty good one. So that's it. This is the shortest intro I've ever done. And I'm loving that. (laughs) Also, while you're over on Patreon, check out Farai's Patreon, Folk Herbalism for Everyone. Farai Harold is a postpartum doula, folk herbalist, urban homesteader, writer, and caregiver. She was born in Zimbabwe, raised in Botswana, and currently living and loving in Ka and Osage land in so-called Kansas. Hope I said that word right. I've never heard it spoken. Her passions include empowering people to build community and reclaim simple herbal medicine as their birthright. Farai derives joy and connection to her ancestors through handwork. She's a freelance writer on topics ranging from plants, motherhood, food, race, fashion, gardening, and much more. Find her over at the Hillbilly African on Instagram or at farayherald.com. All those links are in the show notes. And hey, I really love you guys, and it's such an honor to do this podcast and to have a small, I mean, relatively small, I don't know, numbers and metrics, they're all relative, a decent size following of beautiful, heartfelt, critically thinking, kind humans who enjoy the work I'm doing on this podcast. It just means everything. It means more than everything. And I'm so glad. And thank you to those of you who are patrons and... I'm absolutely fine with those of you who aren't patrons as well. (laughs) Okay, let's get into the episode. 
Hey, Farai, welcome to Medicine Stories. It's so cool to be seeing you and talking to you after um, a long time of Instagram friendship. Yeah, for sure. Thank you so much for having me, Amber. It's, I'm excited to be here. Yeah, I'm excited to learn more about you and just um, I'm feeling, as I've said to you before, a focus on more just folk herbalism and conversations with how people are living their daily lives and relationship to plants. And I know this is a focus of yours. Your Patreon is folk herbalism for everyone. So I want to start in a place I feel like I haven't started for a while with, with my guests, even though it's one of my favorite questions to ask, which is please tell us about your name, any aspect of your name, any of your names, uh, what it means to you and where it comes from and who your people are and all that. Well, it's actually funny that you bring that up because I was reflecting on my name yesterday because I like to joke that, uh, so for I means rejoice. And I like to joke that my mom either cursed me or blessed me when she named me that because I'm truly a happy-go-lucky person most of the time. And I can, I mean, we all have moments of crabbiness, but I'm really good at finding the silver lining and finding gratitude. And I've had a pretty challenging life and I've been able to not be embittered by it. I'm just like super joyful. And so I feel like my mom (laughs) knew exactly what she was doing when she named me that. So I'm like, I don't know if this is a blessing or a curse. I feel like I should be upset, more upset about this than I am. And I'm not. So yeah, my first name, Farai, means rejoice. My middle name is Diana. I'm named for my grandmother on my mother's side. So I'm half Zimbabwean. So Diana was my Zimbabwean grandmother. And I love the, so my father was an archer. Diana is oh, the goddess associated with Artemis, who was, you know, a goddess of uh, archery, among other things. And so I was like, oh, it's like two parts of my ancestry melding together in this cute way for my name. And then my last name is Harold. And uh, my aunt Rosemary tells me that it means champion. Um, so I'm like, yeah, I'll be a, I'll be a joyful goddess of archery champion any day (laughs) that's my name so your Botswanan grandmother has a Greek goddess name Zimbabwean Zimbabwe I grew up in Botswana so people often get confused but no yeah my my grandmother had a yeah an English name yeah Diana is now associated with English yeah Zimbabwe was colonized by the British Mm -hmm. so I'm assuming that's why her parents or whoever named her you know gave her an English name as opposed to a Zimbabwean name I mean most Zimbabweans have you know an English name and a and a Shona name but not all of them and my mother didn't give me an English first name either so how did your family to why did they choose to come to the states well my father is American um, born and raised in Kansas farm boy and he moved to Zimbabwe to for archery, right? He was a pharmacist and he was just kind of fed up with the ways and values in which like people were hunting among other things. I think he was just done with America and wanted to be in the wilderness somewhere. And so the way that it was explained to me was that he was like, okay, I'm either going to Australia or I'm going to Zimbabwe. And he picked Zimbabwe and he moved there with my brother, my half brother, Jason. And then when he was there, he met my mom and my, he was, because he was a pharmacist, he also, you know, worked at hospitals and did other things. So he met my mom and I was born not too long after that. And um, my whole, most other than my brother, Jason, who lives here and my father's family, my dad was, I feel like he found his place there and he he didn't come back. He died there. And my mom also lived there. My mom's side of the family, all they're scattered around the globe, but mostly my family's in Southern Africa or Kansas. And so when you came to the States, was your father still living? It was like the three of yes. you. 
Yes, he passed about five years ago and I moved here when I was 18. So my dad had this really weird, I mean, he moved to America, I don't know, maybe 30, 40, no, it was probably like 35 years ago. And life was very different when he left. And uh, when I turned 18, I was, so I grew up in Botswana and the way that it is, is that when you turn 18, if you're not from there, you have to prove what you're doing there. Like, are you going to go to school? Are you going to work? And my dad was like, you're going to go to America. You're going to get an education. He was like, you can wash dishes and stay at a boarding house and pay your way through college. I was like, <laughs> he, 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 I think he was thinking that college was still like a hundred dollars a semester, like it was when he was a kid. <laughs> so yeah, I moved here when I was 18, all alone. I didn't know anyone. I had never been here before. I hadn't, I moved in with my brother, Jason. I hadn't seen him in uh, maybe a decade, but yeah, I didn't know anyone. And I moved here about, uh, I'm 18, I'm 30 now. So about 11, 12 years ago. Wow. And the last time I was home was uh, for my dad's funeral about five years ago. Mm. Yeah. So I have, you know, dual citizenship because my dad's American, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So I'm thinking too of your Instagram name and how that clearly ties yeah. into the story. Yeah, it does. As some people love my Instagram name and I've had like a few people get offended by it. <laughs> I can imagine. Like what is, well, so it's the hillbilly African. Yeah. And what, what have they found offensive? The hillbilly part. They think that I'm making light of it. But the fact is, is my family's from Southern Kansas and I have lineage from the South. We are, my family is they are hillbillies not all of them but you know the the way back when they are they were so I love you know the, I thought it was hilarious when I came up with that and I was like I'm rolling with it <laughs> yeah it's definitely intriguing I, I say the same thing about my family and my dad's line the hills so literally their last name is hill and they were just like in the hollers of North Carolina. They were moonshiners. And I've seen the photos <laughs> like, though, they were real hillbillies. Like, I don't mean this in a negative way, even though I, I understand that that um, that word does have negative connotations for people. Sure. So I'm thinking our daughters are the same age. So your little one probably has not gone back to Botswana. Um, with you. No, That's not yet. Not yet. We got our passports. And her passport right when COVID hit with the intention of going home mm -hmm. in the summer of last year. <laughs> and you know, that, not, that has not happened. I'm so excited to take her there um, and for her to see everything and to just be immersed in the culture because I haven't been to Zimbabwe, which is where I was born since I was 16. That was the last time. And it's one of the most beautiful places on earth. Mm. And uh, I just can't wait to... Uh, just for her to be in the floor and fauna and just to, uh, I can't wait. I can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. I was going to ask you, so do you have memories of herbalism or any plant connections in your family or for yourself when you were growing up? I mean, from my African side, right. From my Zimbabwean side, the only people that I knew to be working with herbs were what we call witch doctors, sangomas, and because my stepmom was Christian and uh, we were, I was raised Christian, I use that loosely, um, you know, we were sangomas and they were kind of looked down upon, right? They were seen as like working with the devil and all this stuff. And so that's what I knew of like people that worked with plants. But then my dad was an animist. And so he very much had like a deep relationship with the flora and fauna of places and be and like becoming intimate with places and knowing things and if you feel like you have an infection chew some garlic and so I, it was really strange like my dad was the one even though he wasn't Amazon he wasn't Zimbabwean he definitely took the time to learn and become a part of wherever it was that he lived in and so now in my adulthood I can reflect and see like those were my first examples of herbalism essentially and then I also remember me like making rose water and like making potions and things like that when I was a kid but no 
my family, we lived in like the suburbs. My family was not very, my Zimbabwean family anyway, they weren't incredibly traditional or tapped into the land. Like we had a garden, but no, there's, there's like a whole other side of that that I would love to tap into and learn from like a Zimbabwean herbalist or something like that, because that's a part that I feel like is definitely missing. I know in my lineage that we have, we have witch doctors, we've had medicine folk, but no, none that was passed down to me from that side of my family. Mm-hmm. How do you know that? Like, what, what are the whispers of those people in your lineage? Okay, so this story was from, uh, I don't want to say that I'm clairvoyant, but I just want to say that, uh, but I do want to say that I've had, I would get these feelings and inklings about things. I would know things about people before they knew them. And then I would, I would call someone who I'd get a feeling about. And typically when I'd call them, they'd be crying and they'd be like, oh my God, this is happening. Or, and I'd be like, oh fuck, like I knew this. I knew that this was, and I was like, I was young. I was maybe 18, 19, and I was in this new country, and I was inundated with all these feelings and emotions, and I was struggling and so scared, and I just kind of was like, I'm done. Leave me alone. Whatever you are, like, I don't have the mental space for any of this. So it left, and I was cool. I was living my best life, you know, moved to the town that I live in now, met my partner who I've been with for nine years. And I took a trip with a cousin of his to this woman. Well, no, yeah, to this woman. The way that Americans treat Africans is like, oh, you're from Africa. I know somebody who's from Africa, even if we're from completely different places on the continent. And so, yeah, my husband's cousin was like, oh, I know this Kenyan woman, you should come with me to go meet her. And I was like, okay, I have nothing better to do. I'll go with you. So we went to this town and there was this Kenyan woman and we didn't get along, obviously, (laughs) because it's just two random Africans put together. And I left and I went with Anthony, Anthony's cousin into the store. And it was a, you know, like a metaphysical store And my hackles were immediately raised. I'm like, oh no, this isn't exactly the kind of place that someone like me is trying to avoid. So I was like, okay, but it's really cute. Everything in here is so awesome. I'm just gonna get like a couple of things for my dad. And then I'm gonna hightail it out of there. So there was a woman in the store and she was clearly giving a reading to someone. And I was like, oh, no, oh, no, 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 no. I definitely don't want to be here anymore. So I'm like getting and turning around to leave. And then my husband's cousin, Alan, goes to the woman. He essentially is like, what's your gimmick? And the woman was like, excuse me? And he was like, how do you, what do you do? And I saw him being rude to her. And I just was like, I think what he's trying to say is what kind of readings do you give? And um, she basically went on to read him for well she she said I don't advertise because spirits talk to me and then I relate to that to the person and the spirits don't always have to say something don't always have something to say about people so then there's nothing to say so I don't really advertise and he was like well what are the spirits saying about me and she went on to like read him for Phil like things on the way to the the town it was about an hour drive he opened up to me and told me things like experiences about his childhood his feelings about his dad and when we were done talking he was like you know these are things I've never told anyone and he was like I'm so glad that you know I felt comfortable enough and yeah she went on to tell him everything that he had just told me and we were both just like jaw dropped like freaked out and I was like okay I definitely don't want to be in here anymore so I leave and then I come back because I still wanted to get that thing for my dad so I go to the checkout line to go pick up you know to pay and I'm like trying to have the other staff member check me out and she comes to me and she essentially tells me all this stuff about me <laughs> one of the things including that I have like powerful medicine folk on both sides of my family and that I am, you know, a healer and the things that I touch with my hands are, you know, 
bless things. And I was young. I was maybe 22, 23, maybe. And she was like, yeah, you fully won't actualize it till you're in your 30s and all this stuff and all this stuff. And I was like, uh, good day, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> but so I kind of forgot everything that she said about herbalism and medicine. But I remembered her talking about my family, my ancestry, right? Because that's always been something that, you know, as a person of mixed heritage, it's like something that we can grip to when we're feeling so displaced in the world. So yeah, that's how I know that I have medicine folk. And I've corroborated, like I later on found out that my great grandmother was an herbalist. I later on found out about other things in my past. So yeah, that's the long and short of it. <laughs> Yeah, I love that. It reminds me that I had something similar. I was also, I was about the same age, early 20s, and I ended up with this astrologer guy, old man, elder, and someone told me like he is like famous, you know? And he ended up looking at my chart and he said, You're you're a teacher and a healer. And I was like, you clearly don't know me. <laughs> you know, like I'm a lost little child. <laughs> But, you know, those things kind of stick with you. They stick in the back of your head and you grow and you learn and you follow your heart's calling. And suddenly here I am at 40 being like, oh, like in a way I am fulfilling those roles or I see myself more as an intermediary and bringing teachers and healers into people's lives. But just I love thinking about how these seeds that can be planted in a young person's mind and heart can blossom later in their life yeah like I was already at the beginning of being interested in herbalism but it had to do with like my hair using rosemary to make hair rinse teas and I felt so good and it felt so right but I, yeah, I didn't make that inclination I didn't make that connection at all until I was at one of the apprentices that I did apprenticeships that I did for six months with one of my teachers and I was in her garden and I was like, oh, I'm doing exactly what that woman said I was going to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I was going to ask you what, if any, formal study you've undertaken. Um, nothing formal. I mean, I've taken lots of online courses. I prefer to study in real time with teachers. And so I've done some doula as well. And I, I've, stu I've studied with a uh, sister divine. She's a Southern, she's a Southern black, she studies in the Southern black granny midwife tradition. And so I took one of her classes that was like so profound and life-changing for me and like postpartum and like my view of postpartum among other things. And then I've done like, it honestly, it felt like a year, but when you condense the time, it was a six month apprenticeship with a, a local 80 year old bad ass powerhouse herbalist that lives in Northeast Kansas, which is where I live. And then just countless years of study. And, you know, at one point I was doing a group with my friends where we were meeting up and sharing and teaching. And so it's been quite a few years of, of study, but I think what attracts me the most to plants is the connection that human beings have with them. And, you know, we learn that through like folklore and, and, and our interactions with them and the stories we tell about them. Um, I'm so curious now about your dad. So he's this like Kansas boy, a generation older than us, but he has this animist ethos mm -hmm. and is really caring about the way people are hunting the animals in his area. Like what, how did that happen? Uh, I don't know. I think he had a typical upbringing in rural Kansas and had like probably a gun. And um, if I remember correctly, like he, so I was born, my dad was like 48 when I was born. So he had lived his best life already before I came along. <laughs> so the things that I know I piece together from like stories that he's told as well as my siblings. He, he was, at some point he was using guns, I think in the beginning. And then he got into archery and then 
pretty early on and then the archery he began to like study he was a very hands-on guy so he's like okay if I'm into bows then I'm gonna learn how to make them so I'm gonna learn what trees go into long bows I'm gonna know how to do this and what and I mean like he made the, his own string he made his own bow strings he fletched his own arrows like I got to see him do all those things and growing up he had this it just intense reverence for animals and and life and I think I'm the one that got to experience that my brother Jake didn't I think Jake got the more westernized version of my dad and then I got the true animist because by the time I came along my dad was very anti-gun among other things and so yeah I don't know what the change was I don't know how it happened in him he re he read like a lot of books about indigenous cultures and he was really yeah it probably just immersing himself in, in culture that's so cool and then he like takes off and moves to Botswana Zimbabwe first and then when the political climate started getting bad in Zimbabwe we left and moved to Botswana yeah how old were you when you made that move from Zimbabwe to Botswana I was about four or five and um, did you grow up speaking English yes um Yes, uh, I'm multilingual. I speak Setswana and Shona. But in the house, to speak to my father, we would speak English. And then to my stepmom and the rest of our family, I would speak whatever. And then at school, English or Setswana. Are you yeah. teaching your daughter those languages? No, I've tried. I'm not trying hard enough. She thinks it's hilarious. When she was a baby and I would speak to her in Shona or Setswana, she would cackle. And I'm like, now you need to learn the language of your people now. <laughs> but now she just, she doesn't express interest, which I think is a failing on my part because I should have just spoken to her. But I'm the only person around me that speaks it. I, my husband has learned some cuss words, but <laughs> it ha it's not enough. And so that's part of the reason why I want to take her home so she can learn she has a you know an African name so I'm like yeah I want you to be around peop your people and see what it's like and what is her name Tandiwe it was my mother's name and you call her do you call her Tandy mm -hmm, Tandy yeah yeah that's mm -hmm. what I see on that's how I read it when I'm reading on Instagram I can imagine how strong that pool is to take her back there yeah all the time my brother I so I have two half brothers my other brother Ronald him and I have the same mother um he's there and uh I want and he's her godfather like he came he was my postpartum doula when she was born I love him so much um but yeah so I want her to go and be with him and be with his kids and just ugh. I have this story that I wrote it's called fruit bearing trees and I just talk about like this time in Zimbabwe, I remember in my childhood of, of like, and my uncle's property just having mangoes and avocados and watermelon and just the lushness and the beauty of it all. I just want her to experience that, you know, and also pride in that. Yeah. Is there any other living family still there? <sighs> Lots, but oh, we, my, <laughs> oh, uh, I, if my, this is awkward. <laughs> A lot of trauma, a lot of um, unsavory characters in my family that I've had to set up boundaries because my mom passed when I was six. And yeah, my family was not there. I don't want to say they're not good people. There's only a few good people in there. So other than my brother, I'm not close with a lot of them. Mm. So my brother and I have made our own family over time. That's so sweet. That's so lucky is he does he feel the same way as you do about some of the other family members yeah I mean it probably took him a lot longer to come to that conclusion than I did obviously because I'm the smarter one <laughs> but yeah I knew early on and I was like you know quote unquote like the cycle breaker so I'm the one holding people accountable and asking these questions and not going along with people's behavior and and so that's challenging for people. They don't like to be held accountable. But in the interest of me and my future descendants, I'm not going to tolerate 
you know, abuse and nonsense. So. Yeah, I think we have a lot of um, cycle breakers who listen to this podcast probably. And I know for me, it's been super helpful to have my sister, you know, to just be able to wait, I just realized that grandpa and she's like, oh my God, you're right. You know, and like to, to realize what those cycles are and what the patterns are. Oh yeah, for sure. It's definitely hard when you're in it, but I knew from a young age, I was like, "Mm, this does not feel right. And I have it on both sides of my family. Like there's a lot of violence, a lot of trauma, a lot of pain, unresolved pain and avoidance in my lineage on both sides. And I was like, "Mm, I don't want any of this. Like, let's fix this. And if you can't fix this, stay the heck away from me. Mm -hmm. So like, what does that look like to you? Have you, you've like put up the boundaries? Have you done ritual work or anything that would like fall under an ancestral healing umbrella? Or are you just like, I'm raising my daughter differently? Um, I have not done any, um, ancestral healing work. I think that's something that I I would like to do for sure. The older I get, I'm still uncovering. I'm still in the process of learning so much about my ancestry and piecing together. So like right now my cousin is staying with me. His mom is my dad's younger sister. And we are putting together so many puzzles. And it's been so good because now I feel like I have a framework, but for me right now, the most radical thing that I'm doing is raising my child differently and healing myself from all the trauma that I, I endured and that my dad endured. Yeah. Yeah. That's the heart of the work right there. Healing ourselves and choosing something different for our descendants. I recently put up some Instagram stories about a visit to my dad last week that I took with my girls and his alcoholism and all this, all this family stuff. And someone recommended the book, It Didn't Start With You by Mark Wolin. And I have been loving it. And it just makes me, I just love hearing people's family stories like this and really seeing so many people in our generation doing that work, looking at what happened and not wanting to unconsciously carry it forward anymore. Yeah. I, I realized that, right. The cycle of violence when I, what I did before I had my daughter was I worked at this an agency that provided services for survivors of domestic violence, sexual violence, and human trafficking. And so my job mainly was to work in an education standpoint, but I also worked with perpetrators, right, of these things. And in getting to know them, the main thing was that all of them experienced violence. Yeah. All of them were perpetrating what had happened to them in some shape or form. And um, I think, yeah, I was young because I probably started volunteering for that organization before I even started working there and engaging in that work and that that rhetoric for like five years. So I was like, okay, if they are perpetrating these cycles of violence, what am I perpetrating in myself? What am I perpetrating in my romantic relationships? What am I perpetrating in my friendships? And then I had my kid and I was like, oh crap, what am I gonna perpetrate on this little blank CD that I have and um, that's when I really and truly began well I knew that you know the cycles of violence how we how we pass them on it's called like the river of cruelty and like you float along it and then you have an experience and then you have an experience and it just floats down and someone's gotta take those things out you know make a change yeah. When, when you were volunteering and working there, did you start to have realizations about your family history at that time? Mm, no, I always knew that my family was trash. <laughs> I, and I, I think I always knew it. I didn't know whether or not I could be any different. I would say until I started, you know, being with advocates and working in that realm and and seeing that there was another way to be. It's not like I was out perpetrating those things or being cruel. I was actually the antithesis of that, but I was not doing the healing work. I was very stuck and frozen and shy and timid and quiet. And if you know me, 
then you know that I'm not those things. Mm -hmm. I was so frozen in grief and anger and confusion and, and pain. And I needed to be like, it's okay to have emotions. It's okay to feel things. And that was freeing. Do you feel like being in the garden or working with plants is healing? <laughs> yes, infinitely, all the time, in all the ways. I think, you know, gardening and it, it, they, it almost has the, and you know, it's been discussed in this series, but it's like it transmutes the pain and the grief and the anger. And it just takes it, like the earth takes it from us and metabolizes it into something else, metabolizes it into beauty, metabolizes it into compost, into soil, into something. And even like the other day I had this experience I was in an empty lot by my friend's house and I was struggling with feelings of like rejection and fear over something. And I looked up into the sky and there was this big canopy of trees and I exhaled and I just felt like the trees were taking it, my, my, um, my struggles away from me and giving me joy and giving me oxygen and just, you know, cleansing me. And I was like, damn, I called my husband immediately because he's been joking about, he's not been joking. He's been hinting about us moving away to somewhere like Arizona where it's much drier. And I was like, bro, you can't take me away from trees. You can't take me away from the forest. I don't know how I'd survive. <laughs> so definitely. And I, and the desert flora and fauna is incredible in and of its own. Yeah. But right now, Fry needs canopies of trees. Yeah. Is your husband still away in the military? Yeah, unfortunately. Yeah, I, I was just thinking when you were talking about your name meaning, um, what is it? Rejoice. Rejoice. Mm -hmm. yeah, and how you're a happy person. Like, I mean, obviously I'm just getting little bits off of Instagram, but you seem to be like weathering it well. And I'm happy to hear that your cousin's living with you too. At least you're not fully a lone adult with a child. Yeah, uh, it's rough. It's super rough. Yeah. It was unexpected. It was incredibly unexpected. You know, he was in his last year getting out. We were like done. It was something that he, I wouldn't say that he got coerced into, <laughs> but you know, yeah, young, black, poor college students, like the military is like, we'll pay for your education. We'll do this, we'll do that. And so it seemed like the most viable option and the smartest option for him at the time. And also looking forward to the end of his, uh, every, every man in my family has served. Mm. And so I'm incredibly anti-military. I don't know if I should say that, but I am. <laughs> and so <laughs> this was like a really rough part of our life, one that I wasn't happy for. And then boom, last year he's gone in a pandemic. And I wouldn't, I would not be able to even be standing if it wasn't for my amazing community and supportive friends, but it's been super hard and he's been getting, you know, lots of pouting and complaining for me sometimes, <laughs> but we're good and we've still got a ways to go, but we're How making longer? it to the end of the year, October, hopefully. I just, I don't, that's so crazy to me. I just, I don't understand the military at all and that they can just be like, boom, we're uprooting you and you've got to do it because you signed up for this and you're still within the terms of your service. Yeah. yeah. I am not even going to begin to explain. I mean, not explain, but even try to understand because they do so many things that make no damn sense to me. Like so much modern American, Western, everything, culture. Right. It's so like counterintuitive. It's so anti-life. Yes. I was literally telling him that this this morning, like the food that they feed them. Yeah. And I'm like, if we're if this is like supposedly the best, you know. Right. What are what is it? What do they call it? The best military on earth? I was like, why are we feeding them processed foods and garbage? and then expecting them to function optimally. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it doesn't make sense to me. Yeah, and removing them from their families and loved ones. Like, I just... 
I'm just anti-military in general. So there's no way to justify any of it to me. But I've been that way since childhood. Yeah. So it's been an interesting conundrum. It seems to me too, like that book I was talking about, and then I've also been reading a book by Oprah and Dr. Bruce Perry called What Happened to You? And it's Mm -hmm. about trauma and like the thing that heals trauma. Obviously there are many, but the main one is connection with other human beings relationship and so here like you said it is a somewhat coercive way that the military recruits a lot of people and a lot of these people have been through a ton of childhood trauma and then they just go into this into a brotherhood it gives them it gives them family it gives them camaraderie it gives them a sense of belonging which is all that human beings want yes time is a sense of belonging yep companionship, inclusion. And those are all promises that are made to the people that they, you know, recruit. Yeah. And I think that's how warriors have always been trained in all cultures, right? Like, through those bonding rituals. Yeah. But then there's this whole, um, all these people left behind. Right. And that's my big thing. Yeah. But you guys have seen him. Yeah, yeah, we got to see him in January for my 30th. We went to the Grand Canyon. And then hopefully he'll be home for a few days for my daughter's birthday. And then, yeah, who knows after that? It's it's touch and go. But again, none of it has rhyme or reason. Mm-hmm. So we just hope for the best. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I'm curious, I always love asking moms, like how you incorporate herbalism into mothering. Mm-hmm. In terms of our, our child or ourselves? Either. Either. Yeah, <laughs> whatever. Um, I think obviously one of the earliest examples of introducing herbalism to my child was just gardening with her on my back. And um you know, giving her herbal remedies, giving her little teas when she was a baby. And I am constantly <laughs> giving myself herbs. I'm trying to shove as many herbs into myself as, as humanly possible just to cope <laughs> with being a human being. And so she sees and she develops relationships. I think the one plant that was like a really, really big deal for my relationship with my child was mullen. Because she, in terms, you know how human beings have like a, a meridian in their body that they struggle with, right? So for her, it's always been like her lungs and her liver. And so Mullen was like this ally that essentially, I don't want to say saved our life, but it, it kind of did in that it was this supportive plant that, you know, was a tonic and was there for her and was there for me. When, she, when we were at the worst of some of her health issues. And so she loves the mullein plant. She calls it her big fuzzy leaf. Mm-hmm. And I, I literally have to stop her from, like right now we only have one plant in the garden, whereas we've always had a little bit more. And she wants to rip the leaves up all the time. And I'm like, no, let it grow, let it grow, please. Mm-hmm. So she's definitely a little, little herbalist. And I think she just sees me and, I don't think she sees it as herbalism. She just sees it as a thing that we are and how we do. And so for her, and then for me, yeah, as a postpartum doula, I just think that herbs are so important to the ways in which mothers and and human beings in general need to support themselves. And so, yeah, slather me in herbs all day, like literally any everything from my deodorant to my chapstick to anything. If it can have plants in it, I want it. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Just like, yeah, my way of self-care, but also nourishing and nurturing myself. Yeah. Kids love mullein so much. It's such a great plant to introduce little ones to. And it's so ridiculous looking sometimes, so. (laughs) What is your main method of preparation for her lung issues? Um. Teas, teas, and then tinctures. So I'll put the tincture into the tea. We had mold pretty badly. 
um, in our bathroom and I am very allergic to mold, but it was setting her off too. And so one of the things that I was doing was making these oat baths. So I'd powder the oats and I'd powder herbs, nourishing herbs like calendula and um, chamomile. And uh, I know I, I'm, I'm sure I did other things, but I can't remember off the top of my head. But yeah, so like those oat baths and I would make almost like a gelatinous bath in the tub for her to sit in because she was also getting a rash mm. her skin was so irritated from the mold in the in the bathroom so that's one way and then salves with you know kids they they spend so much time outside so plantain salve calendula salve for scrapes and bruises and um and then teas oh you were asking about health so about mullen and lungs my bad i got distracted <laughs> Um, Dr. Aviva Ram, I love her. She has that book, Naturally Healthy yeah. Babies and Children, I think. And uh, there was a, it's called Auntie Aviva's Cough Syrup. Mm -hmm. And it's, she has a recipe for the book, uh, in the book. And it has many things. And I think one of the first times that I ever started making that, I didn't have everything that it needed. So I just made what I had. And one of those things was mullein. And uh, I made that and it was so incredible and amazing. And yeah, I haven't looked back. I always try to have a on hand for things. Mm -hmm. And one of the easiest preparations obviously is tea sweetened with a little bit of honey for kids. And then make sure you're straining it through that fine, like a coffee filter because Mullen has those irritating hairs that could affect some people. Yeah. I love that book. I got that book 15 years ago when I was pregnant with my oldest and it was just so many times I was so happy it was on my shelf. Like that book is a lifesaver. I don't know. I recommend it to anybody that has a child. Because mm -hmm. it's like alphabetized by ailment. So anything that's going on with your kid, you can just open that book to get some help. And yeah, I will never not refer to it. You know, we've never had ear infections or anything, but she recently was having ear pain and I was like, oh crap. I don't even know what to do because even if you know how to interact with plants you don't always know what to do um, off the top of your head and so to have that is amazing and yeah she had swimmer's ear oh yeah she talks about that and I was like oh thank god auntie Aviva uh-huh even her podcast was so helpful when my daughter was a baby uh-huh so what did you do for the swimmer's ear I've always just got the alcohol drops from like the pharmacy that's what it was so yeah that's what she she prescribed she also suggested a, a warm hot water bottle them lying on it to encourage the water to leave, you know drip out I believe that was it and then yeah getting the alcohol drops yeah yeah I was at the river a few years ago and there was a family whose blanket was near ours and the teenage boy was like oh my gosh I've got water in my ear and he was just he was like miserable he's like I want to go I, I feel so crappy and I always have those alcohol drops with me when we go to the river so I was like excuse me couldn't help it over here you know and they the family had never heard of them before and he used it and he was like oh my gosh it's gone thank you and I I like I didn't know about it either until someone told me about those and they're so helpful if you tend to get water in your ear yeah I was really grateful to know that yeah and yeah I know especially when it's yourself or your kid who has something pressing, like it is really hard to remember what to do. And then you talk to someone or you open the book and you're like, oh, of course, yeah, no, of course I'm going to be using Mullen for this, you know, but when you're triggered, it can yeah. be really hard to remember. Yes, exactly. And that's why I keep that book on me all times. Like I actually want more than one copy <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> floating around in the house. Yeah, I've made ear drops uh, by just putting garlic and mullein in olive oil, or sometimes I'll do it in the St. John's wort oil that we have already made, but my kids have never had ear problems. So we've never had to use them and then they go bad and we throw them out, but it's, I always want ear remedies on hand because earaches are so terrible. Yeah. I keep um, garlic mullein drops on hand anyway, just because with allergies and things like that, I think it's part of the reason why maybe we've never gotten is um, ear infections is because I'm proactive. Like if you know your child is incredibly snotty or has intense allergies, like 
every so often I will put a couple drops in the ears just to fight off because you know that mucus will come up in in, in your sinuses and will cause an infection if you're not careful so every once in a while but I so that's why I like to have it on hand do you ever um heat it before you drop it in yeah like dipping it in the in like a cup of hot water and yeah. you can even use it on dogs and so mm-hmm. I kept it on I also keep it on hand for my dogs just in case wow cool yeah that's a whole nother realm is oh. herbal care for pets yes is the one that I'm exploring now that I have chickens uh I have Juliet de Bear Clay Levy's book I have not looked at it yet but it's one of the only ones that I know of. It's old too. She was like the original person. Yeah. That. Yeah. I don't know if there are any other herbalists who are writing books about herbal care for dogs and, and, and farm animals, but. Yeah. I had to make a whole chicken first aid kit last year. I was like, wow, I never, <laughs> I never knew when I decided to start keeping chickens that this is where we'd be going. I'm slowly building mine too. Yeah. Cause it, it re- chicken keeping really is a whole education. And I've learned that a lot of it is around, um, first aid issues. Mm-hmm. That's what I'm hoping I never have to deal with, mm-hmm. <laughs> but I want to be prepared for. Yeah. We, have, we just got another one yesterday. So we now have four. So I'm tentatively excited and also terrified at their care. That's probably what kept me away from chicken keeping for the longest time was like, what happens to them if, you know, they fall ill or they get hurt? Will I be able to take care of them? Will I be able to euthanize them if it's past, you know, care and it's the humane thing to do? Yeah, there were all these questions that I had to contend with before I felt comfortable. Yeah, it's a lot. And like, you really have to be taking care of yourself mm-hmm. in order to take care of other people. And that includes chickens. Cause you got to be out there every day, sometimes multiple times a day, depending on their age and your setup to be checking in on them. Well, one thing I was thinking about is that it's kind of like how our conversation is going towards like herbal remedies to have on hand um, with kids and chickens is any kind of wound spray. And mm-hmm. I've never made one myself, but I always buy them from other people when it's time with like alcohol, you know, some sort of antiseptic uh, medium with, antibacterial herbs in it, like yarrow or something. And I, I, that came in handy with our chicken who got attacked by, we think a raccoon last year. Yeah. I'm pretty basic. Hydrogen peroxide is like my favorite thing mm-hmm. for those things, like any cuts, wounds, or scrapes, because I don't know, maybe it's just cause I've always had this giant bottle of it. Cause I worked at the uh, health store, but yeah, for wounds, like the first thing that I will do before I apply plants is just spray it with hydrogen peroxide and then go in with a poultice or a salve or something like that. But Rosemary Gladstar has like an old school, it's not old school. She had this recipe in one of her first books that was a skin soothing spray. And it was, I believe calendula tincture and lavender tincture mixed together with like a little bit of witch hazel and lavender essential oil. I think that was the original recipe. And I, I've i tweaked it so much because now, you know, like I don't put the essential oil or sometimes I only infuse it in witch hazel or, you know, so it's become like this morphing thing for my family where sometimes it's skin soothing spray, sometimes it's sunburn stuff. I, I got like a really gnarly burn on my foot when I was wearing a wool sock and I accidentally like dumped boiling water on my foot. And that spray was the only reason I think that I didn't like have redness and blistering was because I immediately put that on there. So any iteration of that is typically floating around in my house. I think her original recipe was for bug bites and sun, maybe sunburn. Yeah, that's another like favorite mic because it can also double as a wound wash. I'm sure a very painful stinging wound wash, but it will get the job done. <laughs> um, I another thing I use all the time is just yarrow infused honey. Mm-hmm. Any sort of skin infection or wound or burn, and it's been incredible. We think we had impetigo earlier this year. 
but I, I caught it when it was still one tiny, tiny little sore. Cause my oldest had had it when she was little and I was like, Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and I got rid of it just like that. I've never really worked with honey topically. So that's interesting. I think that's fun. I mean, I, I have an herbal, there's a herbal hair company called Camille Rose Naturals that makes products for black hair. And she has a product that's like mostly honey and nettles. And I love it so much for my hair. And I, I don't know why I've never really put it on my skin like that, but that sounds amazing. That sounds brilliant because honey is such a healing yeah. medium. Yeah, it's incredible. It's super antibacterial and vulnerary wound healing. I think um, I'm just trying to eat it. That's my main yeah, problem. It is hard with kids. Her sore was like right above her lip. So she was just like lick it off immediately. Mm -hmm. um, a friend of mine pulled a tumor out of her dog using a black salve. So mm -hmm. Apply the black salve like to his belly and over. I think it took about a month. Um, the tumor came through the skin and out of his body. That's wild. Yeah, black salve is a whole other thing that we have to have that on hand because it's splinter season. And um, sometimes, you know, kids, especially at the young age that my daughter is getting a splinter out, it's like pulling teeth. Yeah. So, I'll be like, okay. I'll put the drying sap, sap on a Band-Aid and then by the time either the Band-Aid falls off or the next morning splinters out and everything's fine. So yeah, any kind of drying salve is also absolutely necessary for us to have on hand at all times. It's funny that I'm thinking about it now and I don't really have a first aid kit all in one place like I do for my chickens now. I don't really have that for us. I just like know where all the things are scattered throughout the house. I tried, like, I made it a point to build one last year, and it's since then been scattered all over the house, right, with everything, but I want to do it too, because it's, like, something that I want to actually create, and then, like, put on my sides, and be like, these are all the herbal things, it's, like, on my list of things to do, for everything that I find so valuable, yeah, like, I want to have, at first, I was trying to be like, here's a tick first aid kit, here's a this first aid kit, here's a this, and it's just all over the place, all over my house right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Ticks. Whole nother conversation. <laughs> oh man, don't even get me started. Uh, at my apprenticeship, um, it was in an oak forest and it was just like tick central. And I was the one screaming and like covered head. To, I've, I've always just had this like intense fear of them. And so preparedness is like really important for me. Yeah. Well, I remember when Nixie had a tick in her and I posted in stories what we did about it. And I think you got in touch pretty soon afterwards. You're like, what was that again? Yeah. And then I, yeah, I wrote it out. I have like what my teacher told me and then like what I read somewhere else. And I just tried to make sure I have everything on hand. I don't know what it is about ticks in general. They terrify me. I mean, they terrify a lot of people. Yeah. It will all the diseases they can impart are terrifying. They can ruin your life. It, it's, and there's these tiny little things and they get on our kids. Oh, I hate it. Yeah. And we have such like thick hair and I'm like, yeah, bro, if we get a, if I get a tick in my Afro, I don't uh, know if I ever find it. Uh-huh. Like we wear head scarves when we go out and, into the woods and like all this stuff just to be super careful. Yeah. We were getting in bed the other night and there was one crawling on my pillow and we were like, how did this even get here? And what if we hadn't seen it? I don't remember. We just put some tinctures on it. That's because I'm sure people are gonna be like, Amber, what did you do when Nixie got that in? But she got one recently again, right at her hairline at the very center of her neck and back. Um, and we just took it out and then put in, I think, Andrographis tincture. Yeah. Well, first off, get a tick pick. Is that? Yeah. Yes. Yes. To yeah, to one of those. And then, yeah, endographis tincture and then homeopathic lead. Um, mm, we don't have that. Yeah. And there's like a few other things. I did a drawing salve on it too with a band aid for overnight, just in case there were any little pieces of it left in there. Yes. And yes. then we repeated that for a couple weeks because it had been pretty deeply embedded. Yeah. That's about the same that I would do. Yeah. Um, I, I have a, an album in my phone of, <laughs> of just tick related posts people have done and different ideas. Cause again, when it happens, you're like, <gasps> yeah, exactly. 
I keep one on the fridge and then I try to have everything readily available like on my kitchen door and then I try to have a tick pick in the car a tick pick like in the kitchen underneath the stove and then another one in the bathroom just in case yeah that's a good idea oh and my husband when he pulled this last one out he just immediately put it in the toilet and flushed it because that's what we do when we pull them off our cats Mm -hmm. you know so we, we had to be like remember to not flush it next time remember to put it in the ziploc no that it always brings out the violence in me whenever i find one. i'm like die and i'm like oh no wait (laughs) i need to you have you ever had one sent in for testing Mm, never i did get a bite and i was reminded of facebook my facebook memories the other day like i got bit on the belly don't even know where it came from but i got the bullseye bullseye And I did not know at all. I was 19 and I had a really violent oral infection that same year. Mm -hmm. And so I had to be on a plethora of antibiotics. And I'm sure that's what Mm -hmm. saved my life. Um, Like piecing it together later on because, ooh, child, who knows where I'd be now if that, if I, I know so many people that have had undiagnosed or misdiagnosed Lyme among other things and so it was a blessing in disguise yeah well also I've just been recently learning um I started following a woman on Instagram named the holistic mom or mother Mm -hmm. maybe and she's really Lyme focused and she's so fucking smart about it I feel like it's one of those things where it's that just people have had to like step up because the medical community has failed people for so long with this one but people can get the bullseye and never develop anything or people can um you can send the tick in and it will test positive for all these co-infections but you'll never manifest it's just it's like with anything else with health it exactly. depends on the terrain and how it's going to hit exactly I don't know or yeah you can get the bullseye and then it would only show up in your body way later on in your life. Right. One teacher told me. Yeah. I was like, it's fun. Yeah. Or it can be triggered by like stress or vaccine or war, or, you know, whatever sort of huge hit to the system can bring something awake that's been dormant. Yeah. So it's, yeah, that's why I'm grateful for the plants. So I'm yeah. so grateful to have these herbal remedies around me, supporting me, nourishing me when I'm scared, like, Rescue remedy is like a really simple, um, very easily accessible thing that I will keep on hand with me so that, you know, I can be prepared. Yeah. At my daughter's preschool, they call them fairy drops and she's always asking for fairy drops. (laughs) So I want to talk about your Patreon folk herbalism for everyone. That's what we're here talking about. I appreciated Nixie watched the video on the right way to harvest nettles with Mm -hmm. me. I've always been given huge amounts of nettles by friends. So I've, it's been a long time since I've harvested them and I used gloves back then, but we have some in a big pot outside that are doing really well and they're ready to harvest. And so I was like, sweet. Now I know how to do that. Mm -hmm. Um, What, what was the impetus behind starting this and why was like folk herbalism an important focus for you? Well, the folk herbalism part was kind of, you know, because of, I'm also a writer, so my love of combining story and history into the plants that, you know, my patrons pick for me to talk about monthly. But, you know, you were also a part of the reason why I started the Patreon, just because you were one of the first people when I was re- studying online or beginning to find like-minded people online you're one of the people like yeah you can do this Mm -hmm. and I was like oh crap I can do this and (laughs) I will do this and then for me being a a person of color being a black woman not finding people that looked like me you know occupying these spaces and then I don't know not being represented and I was like well how do I combat that and it's by putting myself out there and so I think I just reached out to the audience that I had at the time and I was like they were interested in the things that I would share on my Instagram and I was like how would you feel if I made a Patreon and so a lot of people were like heck yeah so I really wanted it to be really approachable and simple and 
make people feel like, you know, this is, this is not something complicated. Oftentimes I also saw that I was seeing on Instagram specifically, right? I also feel like with the pandemic, natural living and like herbalism and things like that kind of got really elevated and became really popular. And then I also saw like a lot of gatekeeping and people being like, well, you can't be an herbalist if you don't have a clinical education and you can't call yourself this or you can't do this. And I was like, um, this is detracting away from the actual reason that we're all doing this is which is like a love of plants like we should be inspiring people to go pick nettles and make tea we should be inspiring people to make a spit poultice with plantain and show them that you may not even know what your heritage is or you may not know what your background is or you may not even know anything but if this feels right if this makes your bones sing then come have a cup of tea and let's talk about it you know and so that's where my where my Patreon came from. Hell yeah. That makes me so happy. Just keep spreading the word, planting the seeds. Herbalism is for everyone. This is in your blood. This is in your DNA. If it's calling to you, heed the call. Exactly. And um, that's exactly why I did it. I was like, I wanted people to feel like this was approachable and... And I wanted people to feel the joy that I feel. Yeah. Rejoice in the plants. There you go. I need a (laughs) t-shirt that says that. Yeah, I'd buy it. (laughs) Could make it um, a Patreon offering. (laughs) Okay. um, Thank you so much. I'm so happy to connect with you and share this conversation with other folks. Thank you so much, Amber. Thank you for taking these medicine stories in. I hope they inspire you to keep walking the mythic path of your own unfolding self. I love sharing information and will always put any relevant links in the show notes. You can find past episodes, my blog, and our handmade herbal medicines at mythicmedicine.love. We've got reishi, lion's mane, elderberry, mugwort, yarrow, redwood, body oils, an amazing sleep medicine, heart medicine, earth essences, so much more, more than I can list there, mythicmedicine.love. While you're there, check out my quiz, which healing herb is your spirit medicine? It's fun and lighthearted, but the results are really in-depth and designed to bring you into closer alignment with both the medicine that you're in need of and the medicine that you already carry and can bring to others. If you love the show, please consider supporting it at patreon.com slash medicine stories. It is so worth your while. There are dozens and dozens of killer rewards there, and I've been told by many folks that it's the best Patreon out there. We've got ebooks, downloadable PDFs, bonus interviews, guided meditations, giveaways, resource guides, links to online learning and behind the scenes stuff, and just so much more. The best of it is available at the $2 a month level. Thank you. And please subscribe on whichever app you use. Just click that little subscribe button and review on iTunes. It's so helpful. And if you do that, you just may be featured in a listener spotlight in the future. The music that opens the show is by Marie Sue. That's M-A-R-I-E-E-S-I-O-U-X from her beautiful song, Wild Eyes. Thank you, Marie. And thanks to you all. I look forward to next time.